Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you. And there's one thing very special about this. I almost always have to begin these presentations by telling people what I don't want to hear them ask as questions when I'm done. Normally, I talk to audiences in the Northern Hemisphere, and like the first thing they ask me is, what temperature is it up there? And while you can tilt the globe any way you want, that usually suggests to me that they don't understand the difference between the North and the South Poles or how big Antarctica is. I've labeled this facilitating discovery on the seventh continent because one of my jobs, as Peter pointed out, is to do the things that are necessary so that researchers, mostly US ones, but not always, sometimes Kiwi ones, sometimes ones from the British Antarctic Survey or others, because we collaborate a lot in Antarctica, can get their job done safely and efficiently and effectively. Peter mentioned uh, Ross Island, where, where his country and our country share a station. Um, it's located right there, uh, straight south of, of uh, your country. Ross Island is actually an island. It's got ice shelf on one side, sea ice on the other side. Um, the continent of Antarctica is over here. And our stations exist on a tiny little point here. Uh, Peter mentioned Mount Erebus, an active volcano is right here. There's two extinct volcanoes here and another extinct volcano there. Here's another view of our stations. Uh, Scott Base is over here in the green buildings and McMurdo is spread out over here. Uh, we don't have one color for our buildings, but we're working on that. We have three permanent uh, stations in Antarctica. Uh, the first one, McMurdo, which I mentioned, is manned year round. We also have a station up here on the Antarctic Peninsula that sticks up towards uh, South America. It's accessed by ship only. Our other permanent station is right at the geographic South Pole. All three of these stations were established during the International Geophysical Year, which actually was longer than a year, lasted from about 1955 to 1957. The international community got together and decided that there were a lot of things about Antarctica that we didn't know and that it would be a good idea for scientists everywhere to get together and map out a plan to study the continent. And a lot of activity happened during that period of time and many of us have stations as a result of the activities that took place during that period of time. The first of the South Pole stations that we built uh, was built out of timber, lumber, pieces of plywood and two by fours. Almost all of that was airdropped. Uh, it was the people uh, landed in small airplanes and picked up the, the detritus that was landed by the airlift or by the airdrops and, and built a station on the surface. South Pole is at an elevation of approximately 10,000 feet. It's quite high up. And although it doesn't snow very much there, the terrain is always building a little bit and pressing down and moving away. So anything that's built on the surface will eventually get buried, even though there's not a huge amount of snow building up. And of course, if you build a building out of timber and it gets buried by snow, it starts getting crushed. So within a short period of time, this station was underground. Stacks were built up to, to uh, be able to access it. But in 1975, uh, the US built a geodesic dome and built timber built, stick built buildings inside. All of this was delivered inside uh, large ski equipped aircraft. This station existed from 1975 till about 1998. During that period of time, uh, the US was able to supply the needs of the station, both for people in terms of cargo, with about one to two flights of large ski-equipped aircraft each day. Since that time, since about the late 90s, uh, a new station was built, the third station, it's elevated on stilts that are jackable so that we can stay above the terrain and have a longer lifespan. And it's now a modern research campus. There's lots and lots of different kinds of science that go on there. And the demands and the needs are such that it takes about five to six flights each day in order to supply all the things that are needed uh, at South Pole. And that is quite taxing for these aircraft. We only have a certain number of them. They're not an off-the-shelf kind of thing. And they're wearing out. Yes, you can rebuild aircraft, but it's a very expensive thing to do. It also represents a single point of failure. If something happened to that aircraft, 
or that type of aircraft. It's a, called a Hercules uh, aircraft, it's built by Boeing. If for some reason something was discovered in that and the rest of the fleet was grounded, so would this fleet, and we'd have no way to get to South Pole. And that represented a, a very serious threat to us. So now harken back to history. Before we had aircraft, um, people got around Antarctica on the surface. Uh, no doubt you've read about Robert Falcon Scott, uh, Ernest Shackleton, uh, Roald Amundsen, Douglas Mawson, and, and others during that what we call the heroic area, era. They towed by using their body, by dogs, by ponies, and there were some mechanized uh, vehicles that were tried out in, in Antarctica. None, none uh, proved to be very reliable or robust, um, and they were all pretty cantankerous. During the International Geophysical Year, as I mentioned, the people set out to explore the continent and to look around, and mechanized, there were some aircraft, some small aircraft that, that moved around the continent during that period of time to look at things, but for the most part, the studies on the ground were done by moving around on vehicles. Uh, Ed Hillary, as you know, used a, a farm tractor that he modified by adding uh, a, a middle axle and putting a track around the tractor. Um, Vivian Fuchs, who together with him was part of the trans first Transantarctic Crossing, used a, a Tucker Snowcat. It's a, a vehicle that's built in the United States. It's for primarily for ski areas, but it, it proved to be pretty reliable. There were a number of other kinds of over-snow vehicles that were built or that were taken from ski areas or places like that during that period of time and used to move about Antarctica. In modern times, I'd say from 1960 on, there's been a number of traverses done in Antarctica. And they've all been done with various kinds of vehicles. Whoops, wrong button. There we go. Uh, the most common are, are large, heavy tractors. They can pull a lot of weight, uh, move things around, and they're pretty reliable. Uh, but there's also scientific traverses that are done with modern over-snow vehicles, like uh, Sweden and Finland that use the um, it's a, called a Haglund's vehicle. It's a rubber track. It's very capable. It's used in the Scandinavian countries, both in their military and for, for uh, getting around up there. And there's modern agricultural tractors that are on rubber tracks now, too, that are used as well to move around. So you just decided that uh, instead of relying on aircraft for everything, that we would uh, look to see if we could enhance our ability to supply South Pole. The concept was to go back to the, the past and to look at what kinds of things were done in the past and how new technologies could be applied to that. Our reasoning was diversification, as I said, not just to have aircraft be able to move things there, but have another way to get things. Uh, another, another driver was capacities. The aircraft that we use, three meters by three meters by 10 meters, and no more than 12,000 kilograms. So everything had to be broken down into that size in order to move there in an aircraft. Of course, if you're driving over the ground, pretty much you don't have a limit on that. And the other was to restore our capability to do traverses. In the International Geophysical Year, lots of people did traversing. The U.S. stopped doing that. Other countries kept doing it, but the U.S. hadn't. So how to get there? So this is the part where we did analysis and we looked at different ways of how this could be done. One of the first things is to choose what route to take. Um, Ed Hillary chose this white route, which goes up the Skelton Glacier and gets up onto the plateau early on and then travels to, to uh, the South Pole. The, the uh, route that uh, Ernest Shackleton pioneered and that Robert Scott followed to get to South Pole goes up the Beardmore Glacier. Of course, uh, Amundsen started over here at the, what's called the Bay of Wales and came across and went up a little glacier here. We knew we were starting at McMurdo, but we didn't know how we would, where we would go to climb up into the uh, polar plateau. Another thing we had to look at is what kind of vehicle to use. Should we use the old-fashioned kind of heavy vehicle that goes slowly? It can carry a very heavy load and climb up to South Pole with it. That's great. But coming back virtually empty, it could still only go about 10 kilometers an hour. It's like, well, that's going to take a long time. What about these lighter, faster tractors? Or what about the kinds of things that were used during the International Geophysical Year? Likewise, we thought about what kind of trailer to use. Should we use the big old-fashioned kind that are very, very heavy, very robust, but take up a lot of the capacity of the tractor just to pull it even though it's empty? Or should we look at something more modern, like track trailers or other kinds of uh, things to move with? Part of the analysis then by choosing those things was to put them together and decide, well, what would the likely round trip speed be? How long would it take? 
how much fuel would it consume, and how would that compare to what an aircraft does. Another aspect is the environmental aspect. Uh, Peter mentioned the uh, Antarctic Treaty, which has had a number of uh, protocols and, and other adaptations since it was developed in the uh, late 50s. It requires that any action that's considered to have more than minor or transitory impact be evaluated for its environmental impact. It's also required by our government under uh, our, our laws. And one of the things about it, since Antarctica isn't a country and doesn't have, have laws per se, is that these need to be published and obtain international comment and that you need to address those comments. It's not necessary that you abide by everything that somebody says, but you need to make, make everybody aware of what you intend to do and address their concerns about it. We are also, also concerned about the amount of pollution that's created, and it turns out that in thinking about this, we, we've discovered that off-road vehicles and on-road vehicles in our country, just as in yours, have very stringent requirements for the amount of pollution they can put out. Turns out that aircraft engines aren't. Uh, they're not regulated in that way. They're more about efficiency and safety, not about the amount of pollution they put out. So we knew that this was an aspect that we needed to pay attention to when comparing the two performance models. So moving from the theory and the analysis into how would you actually do this into practice, we looked at what other people were doing. There are a number of other traverses that are taking place in Antarctica for resupply. The Russians for many years have been going from Myrny to their station Vostok. Um, the Chinese have recently established a new station at a place called Dome, likewise for the Japanese. Uh, the Germans are moving to an inland station. And for many years, the French and Italians together have, have operated Dome C and supplied it by traverse. Some aircraft move back and forth to move people. Okay, so the other things that we looked at were air photos, uh, satellite imagery. What can you tell from satellite imagery? In particular, we're concerned about crevassing. And we established that uh, ground penetrating radar was a wonderful tool for finding uh, buried crevasses. Open crevasses are not a problem. You can see them, they're right there. But ones that get bridged over by blowing snow are, are like death traps. And it turns out ground penetrating radar is a wonderful tool for looking for not just uniform stratigraphy in the snow, but places where there's a void. And we can tell from the, uh, using ground penetrating radar, which could be flown uh, by a helicopter or a small <laughs> aircraft or be dragged on the ground, uh, where these are. So we chose a route. We chose to use what's called the Leverett Glacier, and I'll show you where that's located in a little bit. We chose to use these tractors, uh, rubber track, agricultural tractor, tows a pretty good load, but can also move at a fairly high speed. We elected to uh, put the fuel that's going to move in large bladders and put them on plastic sleds. These are about five mil millimeter thick, ultra high molecular weight uh, plastic sleds. And for cargo, we use the same kind of sled with an airbag and a platform to put cargo on top of. Turns out they're very light, they're not very expensive, they're easy to tow, and they do a, um, they allow the tractor to pull a, a very large load. We were concerned about the, the bladders. I wish I had time to show you the videos of this, but we did a test on these, a, a, a extended wear, a, a death test on these. Uh, we ran them back and forth with fuel in them in a, in a laboratory test until they failed to see how long that they would last and how they went about failing to make sure that they were safe to use. We also looked at what kind of imprint this would have. Um, I, it may not be easy to see, but this is a traverse route uh, near McMurdo, a part that we've driven over many times. This is what it looks like from satellite imagery. Crevasses were the, the big obstacle. We didn't want to cross over any. So in places where we couldn't avoid them, where we were going to have to drive over them, we opened up the bridge and we plowed snow into it and, and made a plug so there's a safe place to cross. We established a, a master set of waypoints. Here's where the Leverett Glacier is. This is driving up the glacier and on toward South Pole. We looked as we started to develop this and started to move out from McMurdo further and further each year. What was the best configuration of putting, uh, whoops, sorry, pushing the wrong button here, putting th these uh, together. 
What was the operating condition like when, it, when the weather was bad? We were using uh, GPS navigation, but we were also using radar navigation. And how safe was that? We went through quite a few refinements to figure out what was the best concept of operation, how many hours a day to drive, um, where to stop, whether to stop at the same place all the time to do camping, or whether to stop wherever you got to. And this is what, what it looks like in terms of an outcome. Uh, the first thing I'll say is that safety was our number one and continues to be our number one priority. We want the people safe. Obviously, we would like to, to have the equipment be safe and the payload as well. But people is first. We've had no mishaps. Um, and we've done a total of uh, 30 traverses now to South Pole. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, they leave McMurdo. And these are daily stops in, on one particular trip. So you can see it takes about 22, 25 days to get to South Pole via the, the trail. We monitor the crevasses that we've plugged because they're still moving, they're dynamic, and as they open, we, we plug them when we need to. Another aspect of the traverse is this opens up a corridor, as we had expected it would, to allow for things like other science. This is an offshoot from the, the traverse route that goes to a subglacial lake that was uh, tapped into two years ago and now has the first evidence of subglacial lake um, uh, biology or life. Uh, this is a, a lake, I don't, I don't know if you've uh, heard about them, but uh, subglacial lakes exist. Surprisingly, they're on the surface of the, the continent. They've got ice over the top of them, and many of them have been buried for millions of years. Uh, we tapped into one uh, on this science project. The equipment that was needed to get there could not have been flown there. Uh, it came by traverse, so it opened up new ways of doing that. Continuous improvement. We started with what was the state of the art at the time in terms of sleds, these steel tank sleds, which as you can see cost a lot, weigh a lot, and each tractor could only pull four of them, leaving a, a net payload at South Pole of only about 40,000 liters. With that same tractor, we now use something that costs $15,000 and can deliver 155,000 liters. So we've continued to, to refine and improve this. Um, these are the number of flights that have been avoided that haven't had to happen to South Pole. Uh, some years it drops down because we are doing science traverses in other places and offsetting uh, flights that would normally have to happen there. So you can see that, uh, that each year we're, we're doing a larger percent, for the most part, a larger percentage of the, the uh, delivery to South Pole via traverse. Also, the amount of emissions. As I mentioned, they're, they're considerably different for the tractor. We've actually measured this now. And you can see that for these various kinds of, of pollutants, that a, a tractor delivering the same load as aircraft produces considerably less amount of air pollution. And we were able to confirm that our footprint is very transitory. Uh, this is the traverse route on the Leverett Glacier. Uh, it's very difficult to see, and it doesn't help being up here on this screen. But as you can see, it's a very thin line that, in fact, each year usually blows over. And by the time we're, we're ready to do it again the following summer, uh, we, we have to use our waypoints to find. It's usually not, we're not able to see it. So there's a huge amount more that I would love to share with you. Um, there's lots of stuff that went on behind the scenes. There's lots of neat engineering that happened. And again, I would love to share all of that with you, but I just have a short time today. So I very much appreciate, appreciate this opportunity to speak.